Hey, welcome to Trials of Narrative Gameplay Design, our panel with esteemed guests here at Ludonaricon 2022. Today, we're going to be going on to discover how to design interesting gameplay systems and narrative games. We're going to be talking about our challenges and what we've faced, how we approach these subjects of great experimentation and difficulty. Uh, we have a very, very talented and experienced uh, panelist here. Uh, we got some really cool game developers, so um, we'll quickly start introducing them one by one so we can get to the really interesting discussions right after. Um, Masha, would you like to introduce yourself as a first person? Yes, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Masha Camino. I'm super happy that I can be part of this uh, panel. And I work as a game designer in the Berlin-based indie game studio called Machine Mensch. We developed Curious Expedition 1, and I partly worked on Curious Expedition 2 as well. Um, and now we're working on an announced project, so I'm also very hyped for this. And I also do a lot of cool game events happening in Berlin and around Berlin, so you might have seen me there sometime when you are here. Um, yeah, so super nice to be here tonight. Um, yeah, George, do you want to introduce yourself? Um, so I am George Zeitz. Uh, I've been a narrative designer and writer in the game industry for about 20 years. Um, I spent most of my career uh, working on more traditional RPGs at uh, places like Obsidian and in Exile. Um, worked on a whole lot of branching narrative games, uh, Neverwinter Nights 2, Fallout New Vegas, uh, Pillars of Eternity, Wasteland 3, some examples. Um, but in 2019, uh, a couple friends and I went off and co-founded Digimancy Entertainment, uh, where I'm now the CEO and narrative director. Um, we are focused exclusively on making narrative-focused uh, RPGs or narrative-driven RPGs. Uh, and we're currently working on a couple things for other studios that I can't talk about, uh, but also an unannounced, internally funded um, RPG, also narrative-driven RPG, um, that we're making ourselves. Uh, and one thing that we're exploring for that game uh, is how to implement non-combat gameplay, which is one of the reasons why I was very excited to be on this panel. And I will pass it to Annie. Hi, <laughs> I'm Annie Vandermeer. I have been doing design and writing and narrative stuff for games since uh, 2004. Uh, most recently, I worked on uh, Guild Wars 2 End of Dragons and Unpacking. In 2019, I founded the uh, Time At Collective, uh, which, by the way, I've been going back and forth on my uh, since then going, is it Tiamat or Tiamat? Uh, and my answer is it's both. <laughs> that is uh, meant to uh, sort of support the writing and creative endeavors of myself and, and other folks. Uh, and yeah, I've, uh, I'm currently running around being a hired gun freelancer, working on a bunch of different uh, cool projects, maybe yours in the future, people out there, uh, and just having a grand old time uh, getting involved in every different genre and method of telling stories that I possibly can uh, because I am a bad woman. That's really nice. I'm Atta. Um, I'm the managing director uh, of Torpor Games. I've been in games since 2012, uh, working in different uh, types of games from strategy to uh, kind of more role playing games. And uh, currently, uh, after releasing Suzerain, a political uh, role playing game, our studio is uh, branching off to different new adventures within our universe. Uh, so we're very much uh, in the subject of this panel today. Um, as our studio has also quite um, experimented and, and uh, struggled with <laughs> certain things. But yeah, we uh, are uh, narrative game lovers and um, we also like role playing games as a studio. So I'm really excited to uh, take those things to the next level. So um, I'd like to like start the panel um, right now and kind of get into um, how do we design narrative gameplay systems and uh, what are the kind of approaches that we're taking as game developers? And I can uh, throw something out there already to uh, start the discussion. Um, looking at uh, all these types of games that are out there and getting inspired by so many different things, um, our primary challenge, for example, was trying to turn something that is thematic and at the core of our story and adding elements where playability and interactivity and stuff that is 
beyond a dialogue can be engaging and fun. And this has been very, very challenging because um, sometimes the things that are a part of a narrative aren't, nece aren't necessarily something that is fun and they need to be turned into systems that are engaging and that can be repeated or you know experienced and uh, advanced in different ways. So yeah, uh, we've been uh, experimenting a lot internally with some elements of that and how to tie a part of our story into gameplay. And we've been looking at all these amazing indie games that have been coming out, all these other games that have been coming out that aren't using the traditional systems like combat or using it, but using it in an innovative way, right? And um, yeah, it's been super interesting, but um, how has it been for uh, any of you all, anybody wants to pick up from there? Uh, sure. So um, you're right. It is a challenge. Um, what what we try to do is um, start with, similar to you, start with like a narrative experience or a character experience, and then think about ways to gamify that. And we don't start with systems. So like we don't think about necessarily, well, RPGs should have X, Y, and Z, and therefore we should find, we should try to find ways to like make that or, or wedge that into the experience. We try to think about whatever that experience is. What are we trying to make the player feel like? And then think about ways to gamify that. Um, and there are a lot of good examples out there um, that I've been playing lately. This probably, uh, obviously this probably has nothing to do with the kind of game that you're making, but like as an example, um, there's a game called Potion Craft. Um, and it's trying to gamify the experience of being an alchemist uh, and having this little alchemist shop. And one of the cool things they do is they have sort of two things, well, kind of three things, but uh, they have people come to your shop and then you're getting them the potion that, that they want or trying to figure out what potion they want. And you have like some, um, like a garden out back. So you're taking the plants and things and you're actually making the potions and they use the physical actions that you would take in making potions as if they, they actually mimic that in the game. So like you are, you move your mouse to stir it and uh, to stir your pot and you like have your mortar and pestle and you move that around and you're putting, th it's, it's very physical, which is really cool because it makes me feel like I'm actually an alchemist. Uh, and then they have a, a research system as well, which is more abstracted, but again, it, it, it's very much focused on making you feel like that person that you're trying to be in the game. And they clearly put a lot of thought into that and didn't start with preconceived notions about what a game or an RPG has. Uh, and I thought that was a really interesting approach. I, I've been looking at tons of these, so I have lots of other examples, but that's just one that jumps out because of like the physical mimicry that, that kind of grabbed me. Uh, and I'll let, I'll let Masha or Annie jump in. I love that because that's like what I wanted from uh, quick time events back in the day. There, instead of just like, a, like press A to do this thing, like try to do something that mimics that, that actually there's such, <laughs> I love this term, ludonarrative dissonance between like, what you are doing as a player and the, all of the actions on the screen, you feel so distant from them. And to have, uh, it's just not like, oh, VR, you have to actually be like, you know, fighting a guy and doing these particular things. And sometimes they are really big and spectacular, but some motions towards like feeling that that's the case. Like I'm seeing games now do that a little bit more often. Um, even just simple things like instead of just tapping a button, like holding it to like, so you have like haptic feedback and everything. I think small things like that are actually very cool. I like to see how sometimes little bits, how combat focused games try to sneak in little bits of gameplay. Cause it's like if they are, sorry, uh, storytelling, because if they can do it when they have ostensibly their focus is somewhere very different. Um, I think those are like, little little bits of gold it's like panning for gold for like little lessons to to take out um i think uh one thing that the approach that i like to take um is i very i'm very f character focused and i think the sort of path uh that you take through the game is very important like uh when i was lucky enough to work on unpacking um uh the first thing i worked on with ren and tim was talking uh, through the story of the game with them and the characters that exist within it, which are very important, whom you never talk to and see, but like understanding them was so critical to how the game flowed and functioned and how you uh, sympathized or, or empathized with these people you never saw. Um, and some of the worst advice I've seen is like, oh yeah, don't write anything or don't waste time doing stuff that the player will never see. And it's like, no, 
opposite. Um, spend a lot of time thinking about the structure of the world and using that to inform stuff um, instead of trying to, I guess, build stuff so aggressively around around things. Uh, like some stuff can come apart or, uh, sorry, uh, concepts can come apart and come together more organically in the things that you're building there instead of just trying to force it, which is tempting, but yeah. Yeah, I, I also, like, I loved unpacking because of that reason, like, um, some of the small things that were in the game that really made me, like, question what I have to do at the moment when I then realized, oh, this is not, like, this is not a bug or I'm not doing something wrong, but this is how this particular person would handle that situation. Like, for example, there is one scene where you have to... Um, put a photograph under something because that person doesn't want to see that photograph anymore. And I like, I always wanted to pin the photograph because it's like the mechanic of pinning the photograph, which I did multiple times before. But then I realized, oh no, wait, this is a moment where I have to do something else. And that was so cool. Like for me as a player then to realize, okay, the game has like a different devil that I haven't seen until then as much. Um, and then realizing that made me feel very good. And also understand the character in a very interesting level so these tiny moments of when you're doing something that you've done multiple times in the game before and then realizing oh it actually has a second aspect to it that i didn't see before is something that's super rewarding i think um but also very challenging to design because it shouldn't be too on the nose right but it should also be something that you can discover after a while even if you've spent some hours already in the game and you didn't see it until then a little shout out to Tim there, uh, Tim Dawson. When you when you have the the photo hanging up at first before it goes, okay, this is wrong. The push pin is the guy's face, so that's like a nice little hit. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah, I think that's um, it. Kind of brings up uh, this idea in my mind that something that we've constantly like been talking about um coming from this much like dialogue and choice uh, of a game like suzerain uh, i really enjoy that type of content um but i always find it super difficult like after so many years because i, I worked uh, on suzerain as, as a writer and designer as well and uh, it just is super difficult to come up with a system that um for some reason is repeatable but is not boring because for in my mind an action that you can do that is more uh, immersive, like as you said, with the alchemy, for example, or actually picking up objects and dropping stuff. Like it sounds really cool, but part of me, the the one that wants to create choices, wants to create consequences and like all this stuff that is generally done through a narrative and um, dialogue in some games at least, uh, part of me is always like questioning, like, is this action going to be fun like eight times over, 15 times over? And how can you change uh, a system that we've gamified that you've built up to fit the narrative portion that you're gamifying, how can you change it so much and make it so interesting that it's constantly an ebb and flow of like changing systems and values. So the player has to adapt, maybe, you know, create their own expression within. And uh, there's always this like part of, of my mind is like, you know what, like, was, will this be fun on the fourth time? And how can it be? And um, is it really that engaging? So how can you like, you know, find that gem that is inside that mechanic that you've designed and kind of like really hone it, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I part of it is um, you have to sort of keep ramping up, right? You have to like, you, you have your basic mechanic, but then you have to kind of keep changing it a little bit. The unpacking example, now I, I, I said this before the panel, but I'm, I feel terrible. I haven't actually played unpacking yet. I've only seen videos. But um, the unpacking example is a good one in the sense that like, it sounds like you were you could you could put the the uh, picture up on a board and that was kind of a standard action. But then you're discovering this other thing that you could do that you didn't know you could do in the game using that system. And I think that's like actually a really good example of how to have systems be more extensible, right? Either add in more elements that um, can be used in ways you weren't expecting or add like new things that you could do that you weren't expecting. And it's a huge challenge for us as designers because we do have to keep thinking, like you said, Ada, like, you know, four moves ahead or like four hours ahead or whatever, when the player's tired of doing this, how can we keep changing it up and adding in elements that are gonna continue to make it feel exciting and rich all the way through? And I don't think there's any like 
stock answer for that. I think it's different for, for every time. We can just get inspiration from things that do it well. Yeah, I agree. And then there's also this moment when the players can realize that they can do something else, which, you know, gives them the second stage of like, what else can I do? And that can oftentimes help when you're like, oh, I know everything that I can do. And this is like my rhythm now. And, and I do this over and over again. But then you realize, oh, my gosh, I didn't I didn't think of that before. That happened to me, like, oftentimes when I played Inscription. I mean, we talked about already a little bit, but uh, sometimes I discovered something new in in the cabin and then I was like, well, if I can do that, can I do that? So that made me explore um, the area even more, which was very interesting because the game didn't tell me, go explore the area or what does it mean that you can turn this head around or something like that. But it was something that was my own incentive and that made it feel even more interesting in a way. Um, so I would also say that there is no thumb answer for that. Uh, because it's very specific to each game. But I feel like every game has their own little like secret backdoor that they can open at some point, which they can let play us through and let them discover the other side of the mechanic that they hadn't seen before. I think there's always a tendency towards uh, complexity in game and narrative design that's not always for the better. I think it's just like, well, because there's more stuff, it's better, right? Um, and as a personal hobby, I really like, I think that cocktail crafting and drink mixing is really cool. There's a point here, I promise. Uh, and you have your sort of core spirits and then you have all these different mixers. And uh, somebody really cool was like, the best way to build your bar is not to just get a bunch of different core spirits, but get something that you can mix stuff with that has a lot more diversity there. And I think that that applies to games <laughs> as in we shouldn't, try to think about adding just more mechanics, more mechanics, more mechanics, but looking at a single mechanic and going, how can we tweak this? Or what can we add to the world that will make the player look at this suddenly differently? I think that works for design systems. I think that works for narrative systems. I think that works for elements in a story in ways that you can uh, approach things like <laughs> the feat I always took in the old school fallouts was what well, I think it was like a perception one. You could see what the better dialogue option was uh, or, or had access anything that gives me a new sort of level of access. I'm like, Oh, that I want that because it is a twist on something that exists before that. I know it's a, um, an interesting new shade of something I feel more comfortable with as a player, um, which kind of hopefully can be used to eventually scoot a player further out of this comfort zone and into a place where they're actually excited to experience totally new things. Yeah, I think um, like designing a game around a core piece and then really using that piece to spread out influence to other parts of the game and really making that one of the levers that has these uh, cascading effects throughout is like a really good idea. But then the other thing comes to mind where um, we need to be careful with like how sure and secure we are with these novel systems we've developed. Um, because we might end up going down this path where we're like, okay, we think it's good, but we haven't really, really verified it and we're not sure. And then we end up building up, you know, systems around it. And then suddenly, you know, if the core part has a structural flaw and if it's noticed late, then, uh, the, you know, the house of cards falls apart. Um, it's something that, you know, it's been uh, a consideration in, inside our studio for what we've building uh, quite for quite a while now. That's why uh, we're thinking about doing play tests and stuff to really um, get some more outside feedback. And that's the other thing I noticed whenever uh, you're inside of a team, it, you really get a lot of tunnel vision, um, both negative and positive. Uh, is from what I've experienced, experienced, as in some designers are perfectionists and they don't think like that something's good enough, even though maybe it is, it just needs an iteration while other times, you know, people are really sure about a certain mechanic that they've developed from scratch that doesn't really exist in other games. Uh, and then, you know, it's not that solid. Um, so I think like play testing, really getting feedback early um, is very key and outside the studio as well, because those um, echo chambers can become you know, negative from both sides, uh, both positive and negative aspects. I absolutely recommend uh, play testing pretty much as, as early as possible, as much as possible, like taking that core mechanic and just 
developmentally speaking, throwing it against the wall <laughs> and to as many different people as possible. I think the the caveat that I always put with um, with play testing and whatnot, uh, and like a friend of mine said of this for focus testing, uh, it's it's a good servant but a bad master. Like it, it helps expose flaws, but is by no means and shouldn't be seen as a guide. Because so I think that I've seen a lot of people. Um, take something that's very precious to them, show it to other people. And if a couple particular people have something that they really want to, to do with it, that's not necessarily part of the core, all of a sudden you have somebody completely second guessing the very core of things instead of actually, you know, running that, that feedback through another filter, trying more, more things and seeing like, what's the core of actually where the flaws are here? Are they mechanical? Is it presentational? Like, I still think that I'm like, I'm always going to be the person who's like, show it to people, have it in, in uh, particular situations. But I think the important thing for there is like, when you're showing it to people uh, and you just sort of give it to them and let them mess around, that's, that's worthwhile, but you're not going to get the same kind of uh, information from it when you more carefully shape what you're going to ask somebody when you give them the play test, what they know to be looking for, how they know to keep that in mind. And like granted a player who runs into something for the first time is not going to have that particularity, but in terms of like, you know, a focus test, getting that kind of focus, I think is important. Hi, that's a, that's a great point, Annie. And that's actually the, the idea of directed feedback uh, as opposed to sort of open-ended feedback is something that we have discovered the hard way uh, in our in our pitch sessions, um, like internal pitches for the team, where team members come up with uh, either game mechanics or or ideas for games, um, we now go into those with the person who is pitching brings a set of specific questions, and we limit feedback to those questions, um, so that it's not like it's a it's a drink mixing game, and someone's like, no, it should be an ox herding game, like that. That's not we don't we don't let people go there, right? We let them only talk about. The, the questions related to the drink mixing game. Um, and I think that can be applied to game mechanics too, where it's like, if you have people who are coming in, uh, like Annie said, make sure that that they know specifically, like they have specific questions to focus on and it'll actually help them think about it more effectively too, because they'll be thinking about those things while they're playing and not kind of all over the place. And then they'll have a more, more focused attention on that and probably give you better feedback as a result. Um, the other piece of it that when you were talking about, I just I also wanted to bring up is there's an art to sort of figuring out when like when it's good enough and you can keep going. Um, and I don't know that there's just not a science. I know that. And I know it's very hard to tell people exactly where that line is. But like there will always be more iteration on core game mechanics. I think if you get the core game mechanic to a point where the core people on the team are like, Yep, we can work with this. This is fun enough. It's not perfect, but we'll keep going. Uh, and it's not going to like completely get blown out of the water later. I think that's a good point. But no one should ever expect that there's never there's not going to be more iteration on it as they go forward. And there's not going to be some rework on the, on things that you've implemented as a result of it. Yeah, and one thing that I'd like to add on top of that um, as well is that you should not underestimate in your development phase how long it takes to make like a good prototype for what you're trying to deliver, even if it's just within the team. Like you should at least take the time to really spend it on the mechanic that you want to test, even though you actually know that you will probably not keep this and this is only the first step uh, of the way, but it helps you so much um, with checking in on what you actually want to have in your game and what could be a core mechanic instead of, you know, doing it a little bit poorly and only taking one week or two days even to, to test it and to, to make it uh, because then you will never have the actual opp uh, opportunity to test what you want to test. So it's really good to keep that time aside um, to prototype as much as you can in the early stages of development, even if you're going to scrape it again. I think in Curious Expedition 2, we had, I think, four or five iterations of our um, uh, combat mechanics because we were never sure in which direction we really want to go with it until the very last and we actually went two steps back again because we could check in okay if this works maybe we can 
double down on this or that. And then we decided, no, it actually is, it's not more fun or anything. It's just more complicated. And this is nothing that we want. Um, so this feeling of always wanting to overcomplicate some mechanics that actually work out fine is something that you can try out if you have the time. Um, and you sometimes will want to take the time in order to be sure that this is nothing that you want to have in your actual game. So, yeah. Yeah, that's that's very um, interesting and also kind of makes me feel a bit better because like yeah, <laughs> five iterations, like uh, we're on the second one with what we, one of the things we've been building. So um, kind of like, uh, we're like okay, uh, but but it's it's super hard to draw the line. I agree with George as well. Like um, it's there is no clear uh, like scientific method to be like, this is where we are. This is the value we need to reach, you know, 50 points and we're at 48. It's it's just so abstract. Um, but for some weird reason, there's always this gut feeling that comes up after you've kind of made a good push and you're like, you know what, this is good. And I think that's that's what we're all kind of seeking. And until we get that gut feeling, it's not like fully done yet. Uh, and the inputs really matter, like external, internal. And of course, feeding that external into something meaningful with good design decisions, right? Not just like pure, we got to implement this and that just because, you know, 10 people said so, but rather than what is our goal? And how does that feedback kind of, you know, allow us to iterate on it? Um, which, uh, which also made me think about um, as narrative uh, uh, game designers as well. How much do you communicate gameplay systems to the player? Because um, this has been another subject that has been like, um, it has been coming up in my thoughts. As in, narrative games are pretty immersive. Yes, they have systems and they have values on top. It it really is a wide range from game to game. But how much uh, convoluted game mechanics do you have? And do you think uh, showing the player the systems and how the values function takes or subtracts from the narrative experience? Um, I try to have a, oops, Jordi, go No, ahead. no, no, please, please go ahead. <laughs> I try to have a twofold approach um, to, to systems because I know as a player, I really hate it when I, it's the diegetic, or I never pronounce this right, uh, the in-world or out-world kind of concept of stuff. Um, and when those kind of get blurred, it annoys me. Like, I hate hearing characters in the game telling me to press A when there isn't in the world a big button that says A. That would be really funny. That's kind of Stanley Parable level of funny. Um, and now that's a goal for me to do in a game. But I, that is very much a thing I don't I don't care for. Having a sort of situation where you're okay with a, a character giving kind of an obfuscated level of direction to give you a sense of like, as a player, this is what I need to look at. This is where I need to go. This is sort of the thing that I need to pay attention to. But then having a clear um, out of game instruction for like, this is what you're trying to do to just sort of help you get along. All right, or make that accessible in like, a help menu or something like that. Like, I think at the end of the day, like we're trying to make great experiences, but we are making interactive ones. So it's very important. Like our stories get lost if the player does not know what to do. So having an opportunity to keep them in the story, but remind them this is how you get through it, I think is the, at least to me, that that's the way I prefer to do things is, you know, more complicated. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I agree with all of that. Um, and a, a related topic that that uh, I, I'm not 100 percent sure on if this is what you were you were getting at as well. But um, as a narrative designer, I typically don't uh, design the systems myself. Um, so the ideal situation uh, is if you're not a narrative designer who is also a really competent systems designer, to get with a systems designer uh who is coming from the same place right who's who's not coming in with preconceived notions of um like you know the, the game has to have x y and z but is coming from the perspective of like okay here's the narrative the, here's what the narrative designer is trying to accomplish now how can i use systems to to make that happen um and you know if you if you can find that person who can like bounce back and forth because there's like a really good dynamic that can happen between a narrative designer and a systems designer if you can find someone or multiple people who can do that or if you can just like get your team together and everybody kind of talk about that and be coming from the same place and for the same objective that can be really powerful like that narrative designer systems designer pairing can be a really powerful one 
and I'm also not entirely sure if this is uh, what you're trying to get at, but um, what I oftentimes like is when uh, games do something where the player character doesn't know what to do as well as the player themselves. Like, for example, I was just replaying Final Fantasy X again, and then they wanted me to play Blitzball. I was like, I don't even remember anything about Blitzball. But Titus also never played with this team, so they were like, don't worry, we're going to show you. And it was cool to have this like uh, in-game tutorial with the team as well. But um, of course, this doesn't work for every scenario or every mechanic that you want to explain to the player. But this is a nice um, thing that you can sometimes do in your games where you kind of combine these two elements together. Of course, Final Fantasy then decided to add tons of UI to it and tons of boxes that made me completely forget that I'm, you know, actually playing the game. But uh, it was a nice mixture of things, I'd say. I totally ruined it by having you get completely face rolled by the Luca goers in your first game. Sorry. The second you mentioned Blitzball, I was like, I wanted to love that so much. The <laughs> yeah. setup for it was so great. Like giving the player like permission to fail, permission to, to not know what you're doing, I think is like, when a game shows me that, I'm so grateful. <laughs> like, thank you for for like having any sort of game where there where an NPC yells at me to hurry up or uh, whatnot is like this. This is not helping anybody. <laughs> like that might fit, you know, that NPC's character, or whatever. Maybe they shouldn't be there then yelling at me. Um, but yeah, like I think that's a big setup. That's giving that kind of permission, but then you have to follow it up with gameplay and not completely smush the player with a bad mechanic afterwards. Oh, this ball hurts me in my heart. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, um, I think the, the communication and communicating with the player is like a key aspect that I think we always struggle with because too much uh, communication as in just playing out all the gameplay systems is a choice and it's definitely ha is a thing in games but then i think the perception of a player for a narrative game especially its gameplay system really changes like in, in suzerain for example we had a pure uh, dialogue based game pure choice based game and it had just so many branches that um that people thought that you know there was a system and underlying thing behind it sometimes they just couldn't grasp at like the amount of choice that there was in there um, but it kind of like skewed our perception to be like pure story is so immersive because it's just pure choice that when you have a system that shows its values, sh opens up its systems and like, you know, its attributes, then it might take away from that immersion that it might actually pull the player out of what they're experiencing constantly and make them think in a different way, which is about calculating values, numbers, strategizing, making tactical choices. And I think doing designing narrative gameplay systems, this is like a key challenge because if you open up everything, then the story now has kind of pushed down from the top priority to, you know, at, at least at that gameplay mechanics moment, one level below. Now the gameplay mechanic shines and its values and its tactics and its choices are present while the overall narrative has kind of subsided. But yeah, the choices you make and the things you do might affect the overall narrative. It's always this balance of like, how much should you show? How much shouldn't you show? Shouldn't you show? I think there's like a little interesting um, debate and like back and forth there. Yeah, there's a, an example of this. Um, if you've played uh, The Life and Suffering of Sir Brandt, uh, which, is a, which is a really cool game, um, but they actually do uh, have, uh, they'll sh you, can, you can turn it off, but they'll show you um, the like the the systemic effects of the different decisions that you're going to make, uh, and as I was playing, I found myself loving the narrative. But then when I was making a decision, making the decision based upon, oh, okay, I know I want to be a priest, so I better choose that one because I know it's going to raise my stats so I can become a priest. Um, and it's similar to like you know Mass Effect does this too. But um, but yeah, that can be a trap if you really want people to make decisions purely based on the uh, the role playing elements of it, um, that pairing it with very obviously presented stats based changes or or mechanics based changes is is is, is probably self defeating in a lot of cases. I actually tend towards, and this is a this has been a point where I I fight with myself, and I've been moving in this kind of direction as I uh, 
as I go forward in the industry, uh, I actually lean a bit more towards transparency with a couple caveats. And one of them is um, exactly as it was with you, George. Like, you know, I'm, I love narrative. I want a story, but like, I can't help but sometimes want to game the system. Like, um, you know, using that out of character knowledge uh, and moving in that kind of direction. And that's something that I spent a lot of time and energy sort of fighting against to be like, you know what, like maybe it's not so bad to have that. Like there is always an inclination, I think for players to, to experience something where they want to go in a particular direction or they want to have that kind of transparency because it gives a level of comfort. Um, and I can see in, in certain situations going like, no, okay, that's like the obfuscating is necessary. Um, but I always, I, I find myself more and more going towards that level of transparency. Um, and the caveats that I have are more like, I think that actually helps reveal flaws in the system to to us as, as for narrative and in design for going, okay, is there something where, as much as I really loved picking that feat in, in Fallout, that was kind of a win button. Like, I always knew I was going to say the right thing. Um, why wouldn't a player pick something like that? Um, and uh, when I was working on Dead State, it was very important to me that we not have a, you know, a, a speech skill that was just a win button. That uh, we we split it into two different ones about like, you know, harmonizing negotiation or like showing strong leadership. Very different ways of communicating. I think the Paragon and Renegade. Uh, options in Mass Effect kind of echo those. And I think that there's a neat split there, at least I have his experience in replaying too, where they have really big moments of like, this is where you can choose those. Um, and then just sort of normal conversation where you pick, like nothing's colored and you just find out after the conversation is done, oh, you've got points in this kind of direction. So you kind of start leaning towards determining things uh, with the tonality of it, like you can still game that, you can still kind of figure that out, but you find yourself giving a little bit more legitimate answers. And if, even if I was sort of gaming it, something that makes me think about the dialogue and possibilities a little bit more, I think is still technically kind of probably a good thing. So yeah, I, it's always going to be an issue. I would say that's another really great thing to run some uh, like gameplay tests on. <laughs> Like throwing it at different people going, oh, okay, here's a completely open and transparent version. Here's one where we hide everything um, and see how people uh, react to that. And yeah, I I think that that helps give elements of direction. There's always a happy medium somewhere. It's how much like time and effort it takes to find it that determines whether or not it's worthwhile. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, that's a very good point on the transparency. Definitely like a large subject as well by itself. Um, to uh, summarize your uh, thoughts and feelings about experimentation when it comes to narrative games, um, uh, I think it would be really nice if we just go one by one about kind of like what is exciting about this, right? Because at the end of the day, we're thinking about experimenting. We're thinking about pushing game design and systems to new levels. And it, within our studios and within our work environments or whatever we do, I, like, I think there's an excitement to finding something special and that's unique to your creation. And yes, taking elements from the outside, of course, but like there's that like frontier kind of energy I feel whenever like I'm we're working on like gameplay and uh, design and, and narrative games and trying to like really, you know, do some smaller twists. So a quick round of uh, what are your thoughts about uh, that subject? And then we can uh, start wrapping up. I think uh, what's what's most exciting to me um, is is finding mechanics that make the player feel more immersed in the role that you're giving them, right? Like figuring out um, how to how to double down on the context and start from the context, uh, and don't um, don't rely on um, the specific systems that other RPGs have used, 
but instead rely more on high level principles of game design and how those can be applied to make the player feel in a way that they haven't felt in any other game. Um, and that's, that's something that uh, we don't see enough. Like we see that in a lot of indie games now or more and more in indie games. But I think the more you can double down on that, um, the more exciting the design and the mechanics design task becomes. Um, that's, that's, what, that's what's most interesting and exciting to me about it. Um, yeah, I think what I find very interesting at the moment is to find strings that I can attach between different mechanics and then um, show them to the player after a time where they can then see, okay, actually, this is something that's kind of built together, but I haven't seen the tie yet. So after they experience, like what you said, George, that they are very immersed in the world and then they can see the different meanings between some of the mechanics that are already established and some of the things they've already interacted with, they can rediscover again and realize, oh, this is actually not just a mechanical meaning behind this, but this actually also makes sense in the context of the world that we are in right now. So that there's also like the player level and the character level between um, those mechanics, which I find extremely interesting at the moment to look at. Yeah. For me, George, you said it perfectly, like that moment where you can actually sit down with like a systems designer, somebody who like gets it and have that moment of collaboration. Like that to me is the most exciting thing is to to be able to to take a concept and sit down with other people and go, okay, here's the sort of here's my my pitch to everybody. What what about this is exciting? How do you think that we can work on this? And like gaining perspectives from from other departments from other like focuses i think that a lot of times even even in an indie space are uh we're we're kind of tribal we do t tend to like go okay my friend my closest friends are other designers or other writers and like not really know people outside of those immediate spheres or like um draw from that kind of experience and I think that leaves great opportunities for storytelling on the table. Like, um, you know, what if we tried to design something to tell a story just through lighting or just through sound effects, like, and what they can give to something like, uh, it's gotta be difficult as a sound designer to have one of the, the things said about your profession that it works best when you don't notice it, uh, when things seem natural. Um, and to have that, that perspective and to bring in that level of collaboration, I think is something that guarantees almost the most, the best success in an experiment or the very least like more interesting places to go in case of like it, you know, I wouldn't even say failure. I think that, that as I put it, it's all grist for the mill, like everything um, in development you learn from and it goes into something else. So the more people you can get excited about it on your team um, and invested in the different things you can do with this experiment, I think it's the best for everybody and it's the best for the game. That's very well put. Uh, I think we had a really, really good time. Uh, we can do the goodbyes now one by one. Annie, actually, would you like to start talking about what you've done and uh, concluding? And then we can go step by step from there. Um, I am, like I said, running around doing a bunch of different uh, cool freelance stuff, but I definitely uh, hope everybody buys Unpacking. It was amazing to work on and a huge privilege. Um, and that's available on, on Steam and a ton of other platforms. Witchbeam is an incredible team. Um, also, I helped work with uh, ArenaNet, or I was at ArenaNet to do their latest expansion for Guild Wars 2, End of Dragons. Um, you should absolutely uh, absolutely check that out, even if you're not already a Guild Wars 2 fan, because I'm very proud of it. Uh, and uh, check out the Tiamat Collective, Tiamat, however you want to pronounce it, <laughs> .com. I'm going to be improving that site, uh, and hopefully exciting things happen as a result. So yeah, that's me. Masha, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah, it was very lovely to talk to you smart people about these topics. I really loved it much. And I think what I worked on in the past that could 
come out very soon is Curious Expedition 2 DLC 2 because we worked on three DLCs in total and one is out already, which is really cool. And the other two are on the way and the second one is coming out very soon. I love it a lot. It has creatures in it that I want as my pets, basically. Um, and I think you should really check it out. <laughs> and um, if you are in Berlin in the next two weeks, then there's also the Amaze Festival which is happening also one day on site. And we're going to have awesome hyper talks there. And I hope uh, that I will see you there as well. George. Uh, so I, I, I don't have anything to plug right now because everything I'm doing is, is secret or under NDA. Um, but uh, if there is anyone out there who is really loves narrative focused RPGs and is interested in potentially working with a team that really lives uh, narrative focused RPGs, uh, we're at digimancygames.com. Keep an eye on our website uh, and get in touch with us and see if maybe we could uh, do something together. Excellent. You. Yeah, we'll check that out. And uh, from me, um, Suzerain is now 50% off at Ludonaricon. So uh, you can check it out and it's like pretty cheap and it's 10 hours of good content that will challenge you morally, politically and in other personal ways like our studio does. Um, and keep an eye on our studio Torpor games uh, and what we do. Uh, we got some really exciting things in the works that are also nd 8 but um, you can always uh, you know, subscribe and check out Suzerain and uh, keep an eye on all that stuff. And that is it for Trials of Narrative Gameplay Design with all these esteemed guests and these deep discussions revolving around these topics. Uh, it was a pleasure. Thank you all for listening and enjoy Ludonaricon 2022. Bye. Bye.